Welcome to our third annual symposium. I would have very much liked to see everybody in person, but we will do the best we can with exceptional technology that's available to us today. I am going to talk about the treatment of perinatal mental health conditions in a specialized psychiatry unit. There is a critical need for this, and the two points that I want to make by the end of my presentation is that this is a much, much needed work and field that needs to develop further. And secondly, it's possible to do it. So it's much needed and it's possible to do it. October 1st, El Camino Health will be opening its women's speciality unit with a perinatal focus. So disclosures, I have received an honorarium from Sage Pharmaceuticals in the past. It in no way has any bearing on this presentation. I would also like to disclose that I'm a mother of three children, or three, two teenagers and one almost teenager. And going through my pregnancies and delivering in the best healthcare system in the world, as well as comparing and contrasting it with other healthcare systems, um, that I've seen during my work with the Marseille Society and in my own medical school training has informed a lot of how I think about maternal mental health and what I will be presenting today. <clears throat> I would like to dedicate this presentation to all my patients. It is an honor to take care of them, and I thank their passion and their commitment to give back to maternal mental health. A lot of the work that we're doing today comes from their support as well as their willingness to give back to the community. So thank you all. Your work makes a great difference. Okay, so this is a general slide just to orient us to what's coming um, in the next few slides, but we're going to be talking about maternal mental health and essentially looking at time periods. The first is the prenatal period or in the first nine months, and then the postpartum period, which is up to 12 months of the birth of the baby. Uh, this slide just gives a general overview of many maternal mental health conditions and disorders. And the smaller circles are, um, the, uh, most of the smaller circles are pertaining to the serious mental health disorder or serious mental illness, specifically schizophrenia or other form of psychotic disorders, depression, bipolar affective disorder, um, depression with borderline personality disorder, obsessive compulsive disorder, substance use disorders. These could either be pre-existing before the mother is pregnant or they are seen postpartum. So I just want to give a framework of how we're going to be talking about mental health disorders. And our focus today is going to be the serious mental illness and pregnancy and postpartum. Um, so this is a very busy slide with a lot of information, but what I want to, what I really want to focus on in this slide is the spectrum of issues that a pregnant mom and a postpartum mom can present with, and also the range of treatment modalities that is available. Um, Again, this really is, this informs how we think about treating mothers on the inpatient psychiatry unit and how we can offer specialized treatment to them. Okay, so this is um, one of my favorite slides. And um, I would like to preface this by, in the words of Dr. Ian Brockington, who is a very famous perinatal psychiatrist and a pillar of perinatal psychiatry in the world. And he has said that there is no nation in the world 
there is no nation in the world that comes close to meeting the perinatal mental health needs of women. And I just want that to sit in with all of us, that throughout the world, nobody comes close to addressing the needs, mental health needs of women that are pregnant and postpartum. So this slide gives an overview of what are called the mother-baby units. I will be using the term mother-baby unit and women's speciality unit interchangeably in my presentation. The reason being, a lot of these units are called mother-baby units in other parts of the world. However, here at El Camino, and in, I believe in other parts of United States, we term them as inpatient psychiatry unit or specialized psychiatry units. <clears throat> so the history of mother-baby units starts, started sometimes in 1948 or 1950s. They began appearing in Europe. And they appeared in context of a, ch of a lot of social changes that were happening, as well as new research that was coming out that was focusing on understanding the importance and the complexity of mom-baby relationships, as well as different advances in psychiatric treatment, the changing nature of asylums in the world, the development of the field of social psychiatry, and also because there were a lot more women who were entering the field of medicine and field of psychiatry at that time. So it was that generation that brought about some of these changes that we are now trying to incorporate here. <clears throat> In 1980s, the Marseille Society was established by Dr. Chani Kumar. Um, and after that, more daycare units were established in different parts of the world. In 2008, El Camino Health started its mom's program, which at that time was an intensive outpatient program. The start of this program was also an interesting process. There was a tragic outcome in the community a couple of years before of a perinatal mom that then led to community needs assessment and essentially a movement, multidisciplinary movement across the hospital um, to facilitate the start of a program that would meet that unmet community need. So that was in 2008, 12 years ago. And <clears throat> over that period of time, what we all realized was that we needed to adapt our inpatient curriculum to the needs of our moms. Some of our moms who needed inpatient admission also had their unique needs, like breastfeeding, like spending time with their babies. Their families did not know what was going on and they needed education. And so we continued to adapt our inpatient curriculum to meet these needs. And in 2013, our leadership, the leadership of El Camino and Behavior Health Services, identified that we needed to have a specialized unit for these moms. At that time, we had some space and a pilot program was started with four beds. Mm -hmm. This was done in collaboration with UNC that had started the University of North Carolina that had started their unit in 2011. And um, the program went on for some time, but then due to many other limitations, it could not go further. And now in 2020, on October 1st, we are looking to launch our women's speciality unit with perinatal focus. But I want to highlight in this slide that a lot of thought and discussion has gone into what will hopefully come to fusion in the next week. While there are, while there are a lot of established mother-baby units in different parts of the world, there, are, there is no accepted definition of how they can be structured. Um, the pair mix regulations, policies, all determine what can be created and not. 
um, the patient's voice is often not heard, unfortunately. The different types of specialized psychiatry units or mother-baby units include day treatment units or what we call partial hospitalization programs where the mother and the baby come in during the day and they go back home in the evening and on weekends. The other type are the conjoint admission of a mother, baby, and family member. This would be the most ideal scenario, but unfortunately, because of our system, our healthcare system and the complexities, it is very difficult to do that in the United States. I have seen a unit like this in India, and I think it serves the needs of the mother the best. What we have done in our programming is simulate this as closely as we can. Other traditional mother-baby units involve conjoint admission of a mother and a baby, and then there are the specialized psychiatry units where the baby stays all day but go, goes home overnight so we can offer the mom protected sleep as well as, um, as, well as incorporate all the programming elements of a successful mother-baby unit. And now with the pandemic and all the difficulties that we're dealing with, um, I was just reading that the palpate, there is really an increase in the level of anxiety and distress in new moms with COVID pandemic and, and all the uh, restrictions with sh shelter in place. Our unit also has some COVID-19 accommodations and we will be using more tele mental health to facilitate the connection between mother and baby till the shelter in place restrictions are lifted. So why should we have a women's speciality unit? Why can we not just treat our moms in a regular psychiatry ward? Why do they need specialized treatment? It's a question for all of us to think about. And for all the administrators in the audience, I would encourage you to think about this a lot more. <clears throat> uh, one of my mentors from Marseille, Neen Galange, has written a beautiful paper that states that mother-baby units allow the mother to remain with their babies during psychiatric treatment and thus prevent both the potential detrimental effects of separation from the mother and the effects that this separation could have on the mother's self-confidence. So essentially, we are looking at developing a care model for treatment of severe mental illness in women, and it's a paradigm shift in our thinking. We want to move away from just focusing on only the woman to the conjoint treatment of mother and baby and then focus on the family too. And this is supported by enormous amount of research that shows the detrimental effects of separation of the mother from the infant, um, both in terms of the effects it can have on the infant and the detrimental effects it can have on the mother. Um, another form of the same slide, because I really want to make sure that this point gets to everybody. So why should we have a specialized women's unit? Our vision at Al Camino Health is to create a safe space where we can offer a specialized, multidisciplinary, holistic care to the mother, the mother and baby, and mom, baby, and family. And we want to give the moms time that it requires for them to receive these interventions and the time it takes for these interventions to work. Um, <clears throat> the specialized care is very helpful because it helps the mother build her confidence in, this, in the task that she has to face when she leaves the hospital. So it helps the mother's confidence. It's real life. It's everyday experience based. It improves bonding and attachment. Um, moms benefit from peer support because they are in a specialized setting where there are, it's where they're surrounded only by other women patients and hopefully more perinatal patients. So they experience peer support. And of course, there is a significant amount of focus on discharge planning. 
I also want to highlight the first point, uh, which is that it reduces suicidal thoughts. In my work with patients early on, I realized that when moms were admitted with severe depression and suicidal thoughts, oftentimes in the presence of their babies, the suicidal thoughts would diminish. They would rethink that they didn't want to mention suicide in front of their baby. They didn't want to harm the baby, and they wanted to be there for the baby more. So working with a mother and baby together helps lessen suicidal thoughts. It reduces the mother's guilt and, I, and as I said before, builds her confidence. The usual length of stay um, for most mother-baby units in different parts of the world is about six to 12 weeks. In our women's speciality unit, the way we've thought about treatment and integration is for mom to have as long of a stay as she needs to recover and be safe and then step her down to outpatient levels of care um, and involving the baby early on and focusing on the family interventions early on will reduce that length of stay too. So this is our uh, women's speciality unit and I'm sure you've seen this in the videos that are playing out, but I just wanted to put this picture out there. It's bright and it's airy and it's quite similar to uh, some of the units I've seen in different parts of the world. Um, but um, I have a little bit of a bias. It's slightly better because I think it's it's just more open and has um, has this feel of warmth and a very safe environment to it. There is also a unique feature. This unit is modifiable. It can go from six beds to nine beds. And optimally, if you look at the data, the optimal size of a mother-baby unit, it's recommended they should be 12 beds or less so that we don't overwhelm the mothers and the babies with just too many people. Um, so it is, um, it's an open space. It's not overwhelming. There is a kitchen, there is a pantry, there is open space for group rooms, and then, of course, open area to go outside. I would like to also point out that we have several other services in addition to just this, just the new women's speciality unit. We have the mom's partial program, the mom's intensive outpatient program. We also have um, a neonatal intensive care unit here at Al Camino, and we have been working with them collaborative, collaboratively to develop peer support programs for our NICU moms. Okay, so this is the model of perinatal mental health integrated care that El Camino Hospital is, um, is going to be using. And we've been, of course, parts of it have been there for a long period of time. But I really want to, want to highlight, and I think some of the speakers and also the peer panel talked about it today, but a lot of mother symptoms wax and wane. And a lot of times patients that come to us for treatment they don't know what they're going through. They, due to shame and stigma, may sometimes under-report symptoms. So we have, we've tried to create as big of an umbrella as we can to assess and screen as many people as we can and then offer them comprehensive yet personalized treatment that meets not only the needs of the mom, but also the needs of the mom and the baby. So the access services provide assessment, screening, community outreach, and referrals. We then have the MOMS intensive outpatient program, MOMS partial program, and then our specialized unit with inpatient, uh, which is inpatient. And the arrows essentially show how a mother can first be admitted to IOP program but then because of worsening of symptoms, which we've seen happen, may transition to a higher level of care or partial and then to inpatient. While she's here, the providers, which include the case managers and the physicians, stay consistent or stay the same. 
that provides for continuity of care, which leads to better outcomes and also patient satisfaction. Um, the other important point to keep in mind is discharge planning. So when a patient discharges from our inpatient unit, we really want to work with them on coming up with as robust and as close discharge plan, as, as robust and as tight a discharge plan as possible so that they have um, access to healthcare providers and a team when they transition back home and continue to, continue to do the work that they started on the inpatient unit. A smooth transition at the time of discharge is really critical. And there is research and data to show that women that that women are at very high risk for completed suicide within the first year of discharge from a perinatal unit. So I want to really underscore the importance of having a robust discharge plan for patients when they are dis for perinatal patients when they are discharged from the inpatient unit. Um, roughly 5% of patients from our intensive outpatient program uh, are transitioned to the PHP program, and anywhere between 10 to 15% of patients transition from the PHP program to um, the inpatient unit. We piloted this and has been quite successful. Patients that are admitted to our inpatient unit attend groups with our partial hospitalization program patients who come on to the inpatient unit for that group. What this does is that it gives our moms confidence. It also gives them continuity of care, not only with the provider, but also with the peers. This, in my opinion, is the most comprehensive and probably the best way to pro treat serious mental illness in perinatal period. And every mom and child should be able to have access to these kind of services. But it is another thing to convince policymakers and administrators um, about, about these things. So when would you refer someone to our inpatient unit? Of course, if a patient is gravely disabled, they cannot take care of their basic needs, or they have third-party support, but the support is um, fragile or not consistent. If they are suicidal, if they have thoughts of wanting to hurt um, others, and they cannot control their actions, if they cannot be managed at a partial level of care, um, then that would, those would be criteria to consider an inpatient admission. Sometimes patients don't have these well-demarcated symptoms, and they present with things like confusion, or I don't know what's going on, or extreme level of thought disorganization that they can't function. That would be another symptom that needs to be evaluated. And, um, and really seriously discussed, uh, both with the patient and families. If patients have perseverative intrusive thoughts that are there all the time, thoughts of self-harm or harming the baby, um, that could be another criteria. And of course, medication changes and medication changes that bring forth more safety concerns. A lot of times I've admitted patients from the partial program or from the intensive outpatient program to inpatient because the number of med changes that we need to make are, are so many that it would be just easier to do them on an inpatient setting where they can be monitored by staff that understands those and also um, can monitor them for side effects and tolerance. Um, I am going to skip through this slide and this is again pretty much the same slide Oops, sorry. Pretty much the same slide, but it shows that there are varying level of symptoms that can be assessed using the EPDS scale and the GAD scale, and we have our own internal mom scale. And depending on the severity of symptoms, there are a range of treatment interventions that are available. So how do you refer to us? We have a central access number. Um, 
that is there on the screen. And for providers, for physicians, there is an option that they can click called physician, option one to discuss a direct referral. I would also like to highlight that there is an option three, which is um, which is basically for patients that don't that don't really come into our system. However, with the generous grant of our foundation, we're able to provide community referrals to patients and connect them with resources outside of our system that would be most beneficial to them. So for providers, the central access number is um, there on the screen, and then you click option one. So this... Um, slide talks a little bit, well, it's a busy slide. It doesn't talk a little bit. I think it talks a lot about the process of development of a specialized psychiatry unit. And as I said, we this process started many, many years ago, and a lot of thought was put into it. Uh, and lots of our experiences, both good experiences and some challenging experiences, informed this process. But about Two and a half to three years ago, an interdisciplinary task force was convened under the leadership of behavioral health services that involved multiple specialities, and we started discussing the development of this unit. We reviewed what was available within our own protocols and policies and treatment plans, and also got help from three different organizations. I want to highlight that we really stood on the shoulders of giants. These organizations gave us all that they could to support us in our process. They include NIMHANS, which is National Institute of Mental Health Services in Bangalore, India, um, South London and Maudsley, which is the oldest perinatal mother-baby unit in the world, led by Dr. Serviante, and then University of North Carolina mother-baby unit. Dr. Brody and Dr. Kimmel worked with us, and we, we looked at what, what they had, and we modified that to fit our needs, the needs of our community. Um, so we made a lot of changes, standardized our nursing order sets to include the unique needs of moms, which included breastfeeding, lactation. We paid a lot of attention to supervised visits. So while there was a lot of work being done, the three themes that came out were focus on risk, focus on attachment and bonding, and focus on family intervention. So the so while there was modification of a lot of protocols and policies, these were the main three themes that, that stood out. Um, another important process in our development was staff education. This included education of our providers, other psychiatrists, as well as our nurses and social workers and therapists. Our staff was um, received specialized training, um, we focused on psychopharmacology, postpartum psychosis, and perinatal suicide. And our annual symposium today is also a form of staff education and training. Um, but I want to, I really want to highlight that there are many, many educational resources that are available. And uh, if anyone wants to develop such a program, resources and help is there. Um, and I want to highlight a couple of other things in terms of care plans. We modified our um, physician assessment plan and physician assessment notes with focus on mother and baby and um, nursing assessment also included focus on mother and baby and the day-to-day -day parenting skills, which has been shown to be easily modifiable intervention to help a patient. And more recently, a multidisciplinary task force was convened within the El Camino hospital system that has OB, um, mother-baby health, and um, our own behavior health services, along with leadership from Palo Alto Medical Foundation and leadership from um, our own hospitalist OB group, Dr. Gritkowski, and this task force is helping launch hospital-wide initiative for staff to begin having conversations with patients around perinatal mental health issues. Um, so as I had pointed out before, we the main elements that we have beefed up in our assessments and care plan include assessment for suicide, infanticide, 
impulse control confusion and disorganized thoughts um essentially this is to um this is to then uh facilitate a broader discussion on the duration and frequency of visits on the inpatient unit um another key component is psychoeducation that is offered by all the providers to the mom and the family and this is really a critical intervention um that can have far reaching outcomes on treatment the types of risk assessments for mother and infant diet so i will not go through everything in the interest of time but there are many type of risk assessments and you know safety is critical so it's critical to do a detailed and thorough and comprehensive risk assessment um so that's our core team um it's um in a highly it's a highly specialized team in an acute psychiatry ward and um in the past we've co-managed patients with our OBGYN team here and um it's been shown that that's that really again results in better outcomes both for the patient and the families and they are much more satisfied when when we co-manage um manage cases um our approach as i had said before is holistic and it's patient centered our patients come first and uh, we really want to put the mother first here and provide her with a safe supportive environment build trust with the mother protect her sleep we also have many other elements which are found in traditional mother baby units including lactation consultation nutritional and dietitian consultation um other in- interventions include really a broad range of therapies that can be available through our occupational therapist to help the mom be more functional and then we have the specialized video feedback attachment work to enhance the mother's recognition of the infant's cues and sensitivity again more on the treatment modalities um want to also highlight here ECT and brain stimulation for a lot of moms with severe perinatal illness uh, ECT is a treatment of choice and oftentimes it's disregarded or ignored because of the complexities of getting ECT treatment access to care is difficult uh, we here at Alcamino have a very robust ECT service and <clears throat> for our moms that have had um severe and unrelenting illness that's been refractory to treatment ECT is a viable choice um we do have biweekly staff meetings and monthly goals planning meetings as well as uh multidisciplinary meetings to continue to assess how our work is going and improve on it um i put this slide in here because it just shows the main themes of symptoms that are experienced by a patient going through postpartum psychosis and how the struggles continue even in the later stages of recovery so just something for all of us to think about as providers and see how we can humanistically and compassionately help our patients because they navigate so much every day I'm going to talk a little bit about a patient's journey. Um this was a patient who was 6 weeks postpartum when she was referred to us. Patient had racing thoughts, poor concentration and suicidal thoughts. She was referred to our outpatient program. She did not want to do inpatient even with all its modifications because she had been to another inpatient facility and did not want to go back. Eventually um she did agree to an inpatient admission and um is fully recovered and what she said she's also become a big advocate to support moms in seeking out a higher level of care if they need to another of our recent admissions uh, one of my patients um when i asked her what feedback she had for me she said being on the inpatient unit was the most scary part 
this was the initial part, so most scary, yet she said it was the most meaningful journey of her life. Um, uh, another case, um, what I wanted to highlight in this was, was what really worked for this patient. So this was a 30-year-old um, married female who presented to the emergency room with suicidal thoughts. She was nine months postpartum with her first child, and she'd had three previous hospitalizations all in the nine-month period. She presented with many psychiatric symptoms. She had tried several medications. She was compliant, but her symptoms were refractory to treatment. What really worked for her, number one, was team approach. She got the same message from all of us, and it was a consistent message that she would get better, but she needed treatment, and she needed continued hospitalization. Family meetings and education played a critical role. At one point, her husband wanted to support her in leaving the hospital, but when we met together and talked about the seriousness of her suicidal thoughts and her risk of ending her life by suicide, um, and the fact that treatment worked, um, the husband was much more supportive. A lot of work was done between the mother and baby interaction, and that helped in reducing her suicidal thoughts. As she connected with her baby and her baby looked at her and smiled at her, she began to realize the value of her role in, in, through her baby's eyes. What also worked for her was ECT. And she, this patient had very good aftercare and discharge planning, and I have to compliment our social workers for that. So the key point here is to keep in mind that this is, can be a long journey for moms with serious mental illness, and um, they really need excellent discharge planning and access to care. Um, Okay, this is another case, another patient story. Um, sorry, I'm looking at how many slides I've left. To a few now. Another patient story. Um, 35-year-old patient with a prior history of depression that presented to our ER with suicidal thoughts. She had, again, thoughts that her baby would be better off without her. She was confused, disorganized, very overwhelmed, poor sleep. She had been discharged from another hospital, and she'd been prescribed um, Zoloft. Um, her, um, what worked for this patient was, uh, was a longer length of stay in the hospital with continuous ongoing diagnostic evaluation because her diagnosis changed from that of depression to bipolar illness. Numerous medication changes were made all while she was in a safe setting. And then um, we did a lot of work with the family and with the mom and baby. And you could see how her connection with her baby improved as, as her symptoms decreased. And for her to see that was very powerful and helped build her confidence. So these were some results from... Uh, <clears throat> from the past few months, but our average length of stay is about 16 days, so much, much less than what is in other mother-baby units, which I said was 8 to 12 weeks. The main diagnoses are usually bipolar, and there is, of course, a significant amount of major depressive disorder. And in terms of discharge follow-up, that is the highlight. We've had all of our patients follow up in one or other of our programs, mostly the mom's program. And... I do think that that's been very, very helpful to them. So um, we are almost reaching the conclusion point. I again want to point out, and I can't say this with enough emphasis, but this is a critical need. We need to take better care of our moms in the inpatient psychiatry units. And providing this level of specialized care is possible. There are many resources available, and I would strongly encourage hospitals and administrators to think about this. It is important to know that the curriculum for our perinatal patients differs significantly from general inpatient psychiatry patients and the, and the curriculum. The te team approach and an interdisciplinary approach is critical, as is robust discharge planning. Um, 
we have to work on bonding and other family treatment modalities. And with the COVID visitation restrictions, have to find newer ways and use more technology, but we still have to keep doing the work, critical work. And then nursing staff, you know, nursing plays a very important role in most mother baby units and even in most psychiatry units. But here, the nursing staff has to be trained to help the mother be more confident in her care of the infant. And they spend the most time with the patient and hence are in the best position to do so. So focus on the nursing intervention, especially the mother baby diet. These are just a list of resources that are available to, um, to us. I find them very useful. Um, there are some very good COVID-19 resources that are available from the Marseille Society. Um, there is, of course, a really good web resource for postpartum psychosis called Action on Postpartum Psychosis and the Postpartum Support International, and then locally, our own Supporting Mamas. Um, great website, mothertobaby.org, for medications and in pregnancy and lactation, and of course, womensmentalhealth.org. And I did want to highlight the El Camino Health Perinatal Resource, which is our mom's program, and information for that on our website. So the next steps. Uh, in an ideal world, we would have, we would be able to have the capacity to prophylactically observe a mom who has serious mental health conditions and discuss with her the measures she needs to put in place and maybe even admit her for an evaluation and give her and her family that support and feedback. Obviously, we don't have that, but that's something to think about. Of course, we need to continue our development of our psychotherapy curriculum, uh, brain stimulation protocols, um, continue staff training education, support other organizations in creating similar programs, and then more data collection and research on the effectiveness of um, women's speciality unit with perinatal focus. I believe that if we have to change policy and convince our leaders to bring about that change, we will need that research and data. And then I want to end my presentation with my heartfelt gratitude to our administration, but and also want to recognize our incredible and amazing moms team um, who change lives every day. We have Dr. Trui, who has joined us from UCSF, who will be developing a parent infant psychotherapy curriculum for us and lead us in that arena and an outpatient. And then Nena Sodi, mom's lead therapist, Kathy Taylor, our nurse, Jill Quindig, uh, Ruthie Eisenberg, Erin Wilkie, and Brianna Baker. All, all our team, you do tremendous work. And for people in the audience, I know that a lot of our mom's staff who have worked in the mom's program previously are in the audience. I would just like to say thank you to you for all that you do. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dami, for a wonderful presentation. This is an opportunity for those who are watching to share your questions via the question and answer function at the bottom of your screen. We have quite a few questions for you to address, Dr. Dami. Um, several people have asked um, you to comment on what insurance is accepted for inpatient care on this unit. Um, Inpatient unit and inpatient admission is an emergency care, so it's regardless of the peer status. Um, you know, anyone who is acutely suicidal and requires an inpatient emergency hospitalization is admitted and will be treated. Thank you. And then a couple questions regarding uh, COVID-19. So with COVID-19 uh, visiting restrictions, how do you overcome the lack of baby visits or bonding with postpartum mothers, and how have your services changed? Okay, whoever asked that question, big thumbs up to you. Thank you for asking. <laughs> and yes, COVID-19 has bring for, brought forth a lot of visitation restrictions, and new data is coming up every day about how COVID affects pregnant moms and how it can affect um, 
affect babies. And I was just reading that if a pregnant mom gets infected with COVID, her risk of requiring respiratory support, including ventilation, is much higher than non-pregnant moms. So there's just new data that is coming out. What we have done internally and in working with the infectious disease um, physicians here at El Camino Hospital and just overall El Camino Hospital administration is that um, we have limit restricted visitation on the inpatient unit to limit any form of exposure to our ex- our staff and our patients. Um, so at this point, we unfortunately cannot do what we had envisioned in the when we envisioned this unit, which is to have babies be there all the time. We're we're closely monitoring the situation with our infectious disease disease uh, doctors and. Um, Hopefully in the near future, and I'm really keeping my fingers crossed, hopefully in the near future we will be able to to support that because that's a core part of our work. Um, so part of what we, we continue to do a lot of family work, it is through Zoom, and we are also trying to engage the mother and the baby. But you again, it is through Zoom. So the mom is admitted here, but we are working on you know her relationship with the baby through through technology. That's, um, again, evaluating and changing that as we go along every day. Thank you, Dr. Dami. So please address um, areas that don't have access to inpatient care. What models exist? Mental health care can be really tough to access in these rural areas. Yes, I agree. Um, I, you know, I totally 100% agree that mental health care um, is not available in, in several rural areas. And access to good perinatal mental health care is even more limited and restricted. So um, I do think with the pandemic and with the, with the lifting of restrictions on telepsychiatry and telehealth, more providers have become accessible to to more people in remote areas. Um, I do know that there are several resources. So Marseille website has several resources, and PSI, Postpartum Support International, also has several resources that are available um, uh, for patients to use. And this is, again, through technology, but there are many resources that are now available um, in terms of serious mental illness and women needing inpatient treatment, I do believe there has to be, um, we just have to bring about that change in our psychiatric mental health system in, in, in the country. Um, that will take time, but meanwhile, we can be informed about perinatal mental health issues through all the other web-based resources that are being offered. Wish we could do more. So I have another question. Um, What languages do you provide services in? I work with many Latina women who struggle with not getting information in their language and who want to bond with their babies speaking to them in their native language and have peer support with people in their culture. Great question. So, um, yes, there is definitely a need for that. uh, Most of our services at El Camino are in English. We do have the availability of interpreters, um, when we have patients that are monolingual or are, uh, um, are not as fluent in English, and we do use those readily. In terms of our outpatient programs and groups, um, for partial and intensive outpatient, those programs are primarily English-based because the groups are based in English. We do not have um, a Spanish-speaking group. Um, so I want to separate out the levels of care. So for inpatient, we do use interpreters, and that's most that's effective to a degree. Uh, for outpatient, we have primarily English-based groups. So we have another question about referrals after an inpatient stay. How do you determine appropriate step-down uh, resources after an inpatient stay? It's also a good question. So discharge planning pretty much starts from the beginning of the, you know, from the day the patient gets admitted and we look at their needs and look at the severity of the mental health symptoms. We look at the chronicity of uh, of their symptoms, the severity of diagnosis, and then we work closely with, with 
uh, what's available to them through their peers and we um, we um, keep of course their a patient's clinical needs come first but we all we also work very closely with with the pair system to see what's available to them and that whole process then form it comes into a formalized discharge plan usually um, when a mom is stepping down from an inpatient unit more often than not in fact most of the time the referral would would be made to a partial hospital program um, and then eventually intensive outpatient and then outpatient care. Lauren. So I have another question. Is there a certain time limit after postpartum for the inpatient unit? For example, a max of one year postpartum. That's a great question. You know, I my personal uh, feeling on this is no, because I've had many moms who presented with significant symptoms that began in pregnancy and postpartum, but they struggle with them and struggle with them and then came to us like three years out and we have treated those patients in our mom's program so my my um my suggestion would be no as long as the symptoms began in either pregnancy or postpartum they would be considered and our next question is in labor and delivery units we ask about past depression anxiety thoughts of self-harm or suicide we then contact a social worker to follow up. Should there be something more we are doing on our end? What a great question. That is a person up from my heart. Thank you for asking that. I, um, I honestly think that a narrative discussion that a patient has with a labor and delivery nurse is very, very valuable. And yes, Asking the questions about, you know, past history of depression and suicide and thoughts of suicide or harm to baby is very, very important. But I also think one suggestion I have, if I may, is normalizing some of these symptoms and he's saying, you know, we know that 12 to 15 percent or even 12 to 20 percent of moms have a postpartum depression. We know that anywhere between 10 to 15 percent of moms have depression in pregnancy have you experienced any of those symptoms? Or a question like, you know, sometimes people feel sad, they feel numb, they have low energy. Would you have any of those? Because a lot of women will minimize minimize their symptoms. And also, the word depression carries so much stigma, especially in, in many, many cultures that patients are more okay to say, I feel numb, I feel low energy, I feel detached, than to say, yes, I'm depressed. So my two suggestions, one is normalizing it, and secondly, having really as open a question as possible and really exploring with, 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 with the patients what, what are they feeling and, and then giving them resources. So Dr. Dami, can you elaborate more on the family partner intervention aspect of the holistic intervention? So more about what are you doing on the inpatient unit to incorporate family and partners. Thank you for that question. I mean, family's role is critical in a mom's recovery, and this is just something we've seen consistent. I've seen consistently in all the mother baby units that I've toured. In fact, I uh, I remember going to a museum in India, in, in Bangalore, and it was really fascinating. They had pictures of the patient, mom, baby, and then the family members together, and um, it was really fascinating to see that this was like about. 30 years ago, um, pictures from 30 years ago. So family plays a critical role. We all know that. And I think our goal pre-COVID was to have a group with a partner of the dad on the inpatient unit once a week. And then, of course, the physician and the nurse would be hands-on in their interactions with, with, the, with the partner and the family member and provide them with education as well as resources and referrals as they they needed. And in our work with our patients, I've often seen the dad being quite depressed and um, have had our social workers do interventions with them as well as refer, give them additional referrals. So family plays a critical role in the mother's recovery. And then family's health is also very important. And these are two critical pieces that will then determine the long-term outcome for our patients. It's very important to address those 
So our interventions were centered around, as I said, the group and then psychoeducation. And even in our programs, the mom's partial and the mom's IOP family groups are happening, although they are through Zoom, but they happen once a week because it's just so important to get the family's involvement, buy-in, and referring them for treatment if they need it. So this is our last question. How are mothers who are dealing with substance use being supported, and what is the support for mom and baby? That's a great question. Um, so we, for, our, for the purposes of our program and our inpatient unit, the patient has to have a primary diagnosis of depression, anxiety, or, or um, psychosis along with substance abuse. We are not a predominantly detox unit. Um, that being said, we do take care of moms through, um, through different modalities of treatment when they're struggling with substance use disorders. We also at El Camino have a dual diagnosis program. It's um, uh, an, 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 an addiction program that patients can be referred to if um, it's determined that substance use is there. Um, if, if it's determined that substance use needs to be addressed first before we delve into depression, anxiety, and then mom-baby interventions. Okay, that's all the questions we have for today. I want to thank Dr. Dami again for joining us and for her presentation. Um, and a reminder that um, we have our next presentation in 15 minutes after a short break. And that's, that's it. Thank you, Dr. Dami. Thank you, Lauren, and thank you all.